In a few months, the world has rapidly changed. And we have an opportunity to use this moment to reimagine the world we live in forever. Powering transformation through bold thinking, big ideas, and brave action. This is Project Reset. Hello and welcome to Project Reset, brought to you by Mission Winnow. Now, the global pandemic has forced a pause on physical contact, but we've seen a surge in new ways of social connectivity. In this episode, we discuss how COVID has accelerated a societal shift towards technology and the fourth industrial revolution. And we consider what it means for our futures. I'm June Sarpong, and today I'm joined by a panel of tech experts, leading thinkers in this space, who will explain what it all means for the rest of us. So, first of all, I'm joined by Rana Al Kalubi, who is the CEO of Effectiva and a pioneer in emotion AI. Hi, Rana, how are you? Hi, June. Hi, everybody. Wonderful to have you with us. Uh, we have Professor Michio Kaku, author and scientist and futurist. How are you, Professor Kaku, in Manhattan, no less? That's right, and right here in Manhattan, as you know, the city is pretty much shut down, which it is really very is. unusual for New York City. Well, I can assure you all, not assure you, sadly the same is true of London. It seems our world is shut down at the moment. Um, and last but by no means least, we have Professor Nick Bostrom, who is a professor at Oxford University and the director of the Future of Humanity Institute and Strategic Artifici Artificial Intelligence Research Center. How are you, Nick? How are you in Oxford? Straight uh, from Canada. Uh, yes, I'm in a quarantine house uh, a little bit outside <laughs> Oxford. So I'll start with you first, Nick. So the Google chief executive officer, uh, the CEO of Google, Sundai Puchai, said that the sweep of human history, that when you look at it, AI is even more important than electricity or fire. Are you in agreement with him on that statement? I think ultimately, yes, it will be, um, and maybe comparable more to human intelligence. If we're going to liken it to any previous development, maybe the rise of Homo sapiens. So if we look at AI for this part of the conversation, do you think that the technology that is dependent on the collection of data has helped us or has, has almost allowed us to be able to deal with the changes that has happened through the COVID crisis? We rely on present AI techniques in, in a wide swath of different fields. If See, for example, how people got uh, stuff delivered to their home. Yeah. Uh, Amazon was a big part of that. Of course, they use AI in their logistics operations and with product recommendations, search engines, um, Facebook, content filtering, spam filtering. All, all, in all of these functions now, AI is an essential uh, factor, of, often in the background, but mm -hmm. making all of these things run more smoothly. So can you tell me a bit about what you do at your research center? Because you are at sort of at the heart of all of this changing technology. What do your, you and your team work on day in, day out? Well, we have the slightly unusual mandate of uh, trying to study the big picture situation for humanity. Mm -hmm. As you do. <laughs> as, as we do, yeah. Uh, and so the name, the Future of Humanity Institute, is, is actually, uh, well, it's bombastic. It's also somewhat accurate uh, in that we try to zoom out and look at what are the things that might fundamentally change mm. the rules of the human game in some way. And, and AI has been a big focus. Um, you could say obsession, really, for, for uh, a, a number of years now. Um, so we have different groups. With respect to AI, we have people working in a more technical way on developing algorithms for scalable control and alignment to make sure that AI systems will remain safe and aligned with the intentions of their creators, even as they get uh, smarter. Uh, we have another group that is looking at the governance of AI and policy issues related to that. And then we have a few people, not really a group, but also thinking about some of the ethical questions that yeah. will arise as machine minds become, you know, 
maybe moral patience at some point. If we look at um, Sundai's statement, do you think that's accurate as well? That perhaps the AI is more important um, than electricity and fire in terms of the sweep of human history? Well, I think we have to look at four basic stages in mm. technological evolution. First is the Industrial Revolution, the machine yep. age, which lifted us from agricultural poverty. Second is the Electric Age, with light bulbs and electric power dams, the electrification of the world. Third is high tech, the quantum revolution, which gives us lasers and transistors. Now we're entering the fourth era, and that is physics at the molecular level. We're talking about biotechnology, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence. But that is paving the way for the fifth stage. The fifth stage is not here yet, won't be here for several more decades, but that includes BrainNet, when the human mind controls the internet, telepathy, telekinesis, you think, and you can download any piece of movies, any literature, communicate telepathically with people, just by thinking, and we're laying the foundations for that now. Now, when you look at the computer, the ultimate destiny of the computer the ultimate goal of the computer is to disappear, to become invisible, so that we simply think and our thoughts become reality. For example, in the next uh, decade or so, the, uh, your contact lens may have the internet, so you simply blink and be online. You talk to someone who speaks Chinese, your contact lens will translate Chinese into English and also give you the complete biography of the person you are talking to. And if you talk, want to talk to a lawyer, you simply talk to your wristwatch. Robo-lawyer is in your wristwatch. Robo-doc is in your wallpaper, mm -hmm. giving you sound medical advice just by talking to the wallpaper. And so we're talking about a world where the computer will disappear and become part of the fabric of life. And eventually, as I said, in stage five, we will mentally control these things that's BrainNet. BrainNet is when we send messages from the mind to other minds around the world. My goodness. So knowing all of this is on the way, as a futurist, you know, most of us who have no idea of the kind of work that you do, we're all worried about the future, particularly with all that's going on now. But as a futurist, are you hopeful? Because what you're describing sounds like a good thing. Yes, I disagree with many scientists. Most scientists believe that technology is amoral, unpolitical, neutral, good mm. and bad. Yeah, there are aspects of that. But I think that technology does have a direction. And that, that is it creates empowerment for people who are unempowered. Mm. Knowledge, knowledge is power. And that's what the internet does. Who's afraid of the internet? Dictators are mm. afraid of the internet, mm. not democracies. Very democracies flourish under the internet, yeah. but dictators are the mortal enemy of the internet because they thrive on ignorance, yeah. poverty. They thrive on miscommunication. So I differ with other scientists. I do believe that technology has a moral direction. That is empowerment of the people who are powerless by making the internet available to everyone. And like I said, the internet will be for free in the future. It'll be everywhere and nowhere. Amazing. And that moves me on and acts as a perfect segue to you, Rana, because that is the work that you do in terms of looking at ethics. Can you talk more about your company and what Effectiva actually does in terms of Emotion AI? Yeah, so we bring kind of a different perspective to artificial intelligence. Uh, we're concerned about taking a very human-centered approach to how we think about these technologies. And so I've spent the last 20 years humanizing technology really before it dehumanizes us and developing artificial emotional intelligence. Yes. So if, right? So if you look at human intelligence, your IQ or your cognitive intelligence, language, reasoning, of course, that's really critical, but we all know from our personal experiences that it's not just that. Your emotional intelligence, your ability to empathize, your ability to tap into people's emotional and mental states and kind of adapt in real time, like that's what makes people really powerful and persuasive and likable and, yeah. you know, successful. And, and that I is how we connect with people on a deep level. 
Yeah. Exactly. And so we want to bring that element into technology as well, especially technology that is so deeply ingrained in our day to day interactions, like video conferencing platforms, like cars that are going to drive us, um, apps that are going to kind of be conduits to our health. So we're on this mission to kind of quantify all of the nonverbal communication that we yeah. use, including actually, um, you know, physiological signals and maybe brainwave signals as well, and integrate all of that in a way that enhances not only human machine communication, but human to human interactions. Oh my goodness, this is fantastic. And this really is important when we come to healthcare and the ethics around healthcare, particularly where AI is concerned. Do you think that this is something we should be worried about? Because obviously there is a lot of concern about this in terms of whether or not AI healthcare in itself is actually ethical. Yeah, I mean, again, I do believe that by and large, and I, I feel like humans have agency on how we design and deploy these technologies. And mm. I think there are a lot of amazing, incredible potential for good that can come out of this. But also we have to be pragmatists and, and, and not naive and appreciate that there are, you know, this could go terribly wrong. Yeah. For me, and especially around mental health, if you mm. think about stress, mm. anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. suicidal intent, the gold standard today is a very rudimentary. It's a, it's a, oh, on a scale from one to 10, mark how depressed you are. Yeah. We can do better and, and we and can And usually bring... the intervention is too late because we're not able to intervene soon enough. Exactly. Yeah. Now imagine instead you have a device or a conversational interface, could be your Alexa or a Siri, it knows you so well, yeah. you start to deviate from your baseline and it flags that. Yes. How powerful would that be, that it flags that to the people that care about you and perhaps when it gets to a danger zone to healthcare professionals so that exactly. something can be done before it's too late? Exactly. And it can, obviously there are a lot of privacy considerations with this. But if you do it with the right privacy considerations, I think this can be really powerful. Brilliant. Now, the thing with this area is it tends to be dominated by wealthy philanthropists. That in itself raises all sorts of other problems. Are there things that you feel that actually the sort of the, the investor community can do that perhaps governments can't? I really do think so. So we've raised over $50 million mm. of venture and strategic funding to date. Wow. And, and for me, well, not so well, because almost in all of the rounds of pitches that I've had to lead, I was pitching to a very specific type of investor, right? A, a very Were you one of, of the only women in the room, presumably, as well? Yes, all yeah. the time, right? All the time. And, and I really think that's a problem because, because we, we, we kind of build what we know. Mm. And we all have blind spots. And unless we really bring diverse voices to the table, be it investors or programmers or yeah. machine learning scientists, whatever, we need to be more inclusive. Otherwise, we accidentally build biases into these systems and perpetuate Which the bias. Which we've seen happening anyway. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So I'm right. very, as you can tell, I'm very passionate Good. about this. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> <laughs> So if we move on to singularity, um, Nick, I'm going to come back to you. Um, this is another area that gets a lot of attention, but your average person doesn't actually know what it is. Um, can you tell me what singularity is? Well, I tend to not use the word very much precisely because oh, people okay. understand it in very different ways. But if I were talking about, say, um, the possibility of um, an intelligence explosion, then that's mm. maybe the terminology I would use. You seem very calm about it all. When <laughs> Werner Vinge coined the term singularity, he said it could actually signal the end of the human era. Do you think that's the case, Nick? Well, if we are speaking about uh, machine superintelligence, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've written about this uh, and in indeed also uh, at some length describe the possible existential risks that could be associated with this transition to the machine intelligence age. I think sometimes the uh, perception is maybe that I'm more down on AI than I'm actually really would, would think of myself as being because this, this book I wrote, Super Intelligence, focused mm. a lot on that. At the time when I was writing it, I felt that part of the outcome spectrum had been neglected. Um, now, now I think there is much more of a balance 
mm. in the public discourse about the future of AI and, and, and perhaps even some need to maybe emphasize more the upsides. Yeah, that, I, uh, I even you see know. you smiling there, so this is good. Well, <laughs> yes. One thing that Nick's book and work has, has done really well is that it has allowed the general public to, to be involved in the conversation. Yeah. Now, yes, it freaked out a lot of people, um, but, but I think, so I, I just wrote my book and I really mm. wanted it to be accessible to the average kind because of non-domain so expert. Im- yeah, because it's so important. This is something that's going to impact everyone, but yet exactly. only a tiny select section of society actually understands it. Exactly. So it's so important that we find a way to make this message as universal as we can. can uh, as you're here, Rana, let me ask you, do you think that machines actually can learn judgment and empathy? Do you think it's actually possible? We can train machines to uh, sense and respond to empathy. Mm-hmm. I don't believe that they will have kind of internal kind of built-in empathy. The, the, the way, way we, we think do. about Yeah, the way okay. we do. So and it's I don't a different think kind of empathy. Exactly, and I don't even think that that's the goal. The goal is to enhance human. It, the goal is to enhance humans. Like that's the lens I take on technology. It's a tool, and and we get to decide how we use it. We get to build ethics and morality into these things. Um, now, now, humans don't have a great track record of always no. doing the right thing. That's that's the problem. That's for sure. <laughs> that's the problem. But do you um, think humans should always be in charge of the machines? rather than the other way around, be. which is what we're being told could happen. Yeah, and I, I'm, 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 I'm more concerned about pragmatic issues like bias, algorithmic mm. and data bias, than I am with this, like, <gasps> robots are going to take over and right. we're okay. like, I don't know. I get it. Thank you. Yeah. So, Professor Kaku, do you think that COVID has almost been a catalyst for singularity? Well, first of all, the word singularity comes from physics. Mm. Uh, and a black hole, when the gravity field becomes infinite, we've called that a singularity. We've always called it that. Yes. Now, the singularity has many definitions. The most common one is when the machines are smarter than humans. Yeah. And they take over so that they put us in zoos, they throw peanuts at us, and make us <laughs> dance behind <laughs> bars. That's the singularity. Now, also, Hollywood has pretty much brainwashed us into thinking that the robots are going to take over sometime soon. Yeah. Let's be real. Our most advanced robots, the robots that the military works with, they have the collective intelligence of a cockroach. <laughs> they can barely navigate across the room. You put our robot in the forest, a military-grade robot in the forest, it gets lost. Mm. You put a cockroach in the forest, it very quickly finds mates, foods, shelter. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Okay. In the future, robots will become as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a dog and a cat, and maybe by the end of the century, as smart as a monkey. Hmm. At that point, I think they're potentially dangerous. Yes. Because monkeys are self-aware. Yeah. They know they're not humans. Now, dogs, dogs are confused. Dogs think that we are a dog. And that's why they obey us. Mm. Monkeys have no illusion yeah. that we are a monkey. <laughs> and so once robots become as smart as a monkey, perhaps by the end of the century, that's when we have to worry. Self-awareness, not computer speed. Self-awareness, do they have their own agenda, mm. their own thoughts, their mm. own desires, mm. their own goals? Mm. Right now, robots have no goals, no thinking along those lines. Robots today are adding machines. We forget that. Yeah. No self-awareness. They're adding machines. Mm. Now, I'm a physicist. That doesn't mean it's not possible, because after all, we think, don't we? Yeah. So it is possible, but our technology is still too primitive. In other words, we have plenty of time to prepare for any possible singularity in the future. It's not going to catch us off guard. And do you think that in that preparation process, back to almost what Rana has been talking about, we almost need to make sure that we put the right guardrails in place so that by the time they get to monkey level, it's manageable as opposed to what you've just described. 
I think we should put a fail-safe system so that when they start to have murderous thoughts, <laughs> they can be automatically shut, shut down. down by simply yeah. talking to Pull it. Pull the plug. Once they Pull have the murderous plug. thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. then people say, what happens 200 years from now when they remove the fail-safe system? Yeah. Robots are not stupid. Yeah. Eventually, they'll figure out how to remove their own fail-safe system in maybe, let's say, hypothetically, 200 years. At that point, I think, we should merge with them. Rather than fight them, I think we should merge with them, become wow. superhuman. Now, wow. of course, this is not for us to decide. People 200 years from now will democratically decide whether or not to fight the robots or take the best of them and enhance yourself and become Superman and Superwoman. I think we should merge now. I think that's what I'm saying. Like, these robots are tools that we could used to help us be more productive, healthier, happier, empathetic, more efficient, whatever, you know, you pick the KPI. And I think we, we merge now. I think that's the whole idea of technology. That's my vote. Wow. Let's, Nick, let's take it on. Let's take it on. Nick, what are your thoughts on that? Do we merge now or do we merge ever? I think I'm scared of the merging part. I mean, we're already sort of living inside a big machine that we have built for ourselves, civilization, mm. and houses and stuff, and cars, and that's quite different from just being exposed to the, the kind of the natural world all the time. Yeah. And I presume if things go well, that, that integration with our technological infrastructure will increase and become increasingly intimate and, and not stay outside the boundaries of our bodies as yeah. well, but eventually like directly augment our brains or maybe we'll upload. The plausible paths to really great futures, I think all, all involve that kind of transition where we at least have the option of becoming post-biological. Yeah, can I Professor ask Professor Kayev, please point? do. Uh, there's one more benefit I forgot to mention when we merge with our creations, and that is we become immortal. Humans have always looked for immortality in potions and fountains of youth. And of course, all that's a fake. But you see, a digital person is a possibility. Once you digitize somebody, you can become You always immortal. have that blueprint. All your hopes, dreams. Mm. I would love to talk to Einstein. Mm. One day, someone will digitize Einstein. His lecture notes, his hopes, dreams, everything he ever did will be digitized. And I'd love to have a conversation with him. One day, you may have a conversation with your great, 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 great grandchild who wants to know about her famous ancestor yeah. <laughs> so many hundreds of years in the past. So Rana, let me come back to you. Um, I'd like us to move on to the next section of our discussion, which is looking at the virtually connected world. So data shows that there's been a 32% increase in total broadband traffic, 38 and 40% increases in streaming video and VPN usage respectively. And wait for this, a 212% increase in video conferencing. Why has it taken a global pandemic to implement these technological, technological resources that have been here for a few years? Yeah, and I think there are two sides to the story. On the one hand, we have all been catapulted into this universe as you, mm. you know, started this conversation. We're connecting with our colleagues online. We're connecting with our families online. My kids are learning online. Telehealth is you know, um, finally here. And I think that what's positive about that is that it has continued to connect us. Like I am grateful for platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams that can bring us together during this yeah. pandemic. Yeah. But I also think it creates an illusion of a connection. And I'll give you an example, right? Like yeah. if we were all doing this panel in person, we would have the audience in front of us mm -hmm. and we would probably riff off of the energy in the audience. And we'd be able to involve them in the conversation totally, yeah. Exactly. You'd be able to see if they understood what was being said in order to modify your answers, all of the above. Exactly, yeah. and now you can't do that, we can't do that. Um, and so, you know, we're missing the 90% of nonverbal signals that people typically use to connect and communicate with one another. Your facial expressions, your hand gestures, your body posture, your vocal intonation. All of that is disappearing in cyberspace, and um, I guess I'm on a mission to bring that back into the equation. I think this pandemic is going to accelerate the pace of innovation 
with the adoption of these new shared experiences yeah. and emotion. Well, it, it has to, isn't it? Because we need right. them in ways that we didn't before. Totally. So if we talk about the privacy side of things, obviously there has been some concerns and issues around the privacy on some of these platforms um, and that perhaps our conversations are not as safe as we would like. Do you think that people are prepared to sacrifice privacy for convenience because they are so convenient to use? I think we need to we, we need to let the consumer decide on that. So we need a little bit more transparency than we're getting from the tech industry at large. And there is a huge push, obviously, even mm. with the social media platforms, to call for more transparency, right? Like right now we all sign, the, we click agree, 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 and we don't agree, really agree. Know. We don't really read it. Just agree, exactly. agree, agree. Yeah, exactly. And I think there needs to be just clarity and transparency around, okay, what are you giving up in return for this convenience? Um, because I think people can make that decision themselves. I mean, mm. you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, my son's school, he's 11, uh, decided not to do Zoom. And so they didn't have any synchronous classes. Wow. It was all video based. And at some point, the parents said, you know what, we're willing to give up some of the privacy concerns in return for doing a virtual classroom. So I think yeah. it's important that the end user make that decision. Completely. If I come back to you, Professor Kaku, if we look at academia and, and what's happening in terms of the shift in how we're learning and, and the way that um, information is being distributed to our students. Do you think that the way learning will go forward will be different from now on? Will universities still be the same? Will schools still be the same? I think we're going to see a sea change in the relationship between professors and students. Mm. Because you can get lectures from top professors on the internet now. You don't need to download a lectures from your professor. You can download master lectures from world famous professors off the internet. So professors are going to become more like mentors. That's what artificial intelligence cannot do. Mm. AI can give us videotapes. AIs can give us videotapes that we can even interact with to a degree. But AI cannot mentor young minds, no. cannot answer their questions, give them career guidance, give them a career path, encourage them. And that's why I think that AI, there are three basic areas where AI cannot replace jobs. One area is semi-skilled workers. Uh, robots cannot repair a broken toilet. Robots cannot even pick up garbage. <laughs> Robots cannot hammer a nail. Thank God for that. Second of all, mentoring, human mm. relations, counseling, psychiatry, giving advice, human advice. Robots are clueless. Robots don't know the first thing about giving advice to someone who's depressed or giving advice to someone who's mentally ill. Third category is intellectual capital. Mm. That is the people who are creative, who are innovative, artists, um, entrepreneurs, Wall Street investors, people that work totally with their mind. These are jobs that robots cannot perform. Mm -hmm. And so I think that as far as professors are concerned, we're in the second category. We have to become mentors of young minds rather than regurgitating data, which they're going to get off the internet anyway. They'll simply blink and in their contact lens, they'll see the lecture on uh, the math or the social studies program that we're te teaching. And the, your contact lens will give a better lecture than your professor. But when it's time to get a career path, a mm. letter of recommendation, yeah. encouragement, yeah. you can't do that on a robot. No, you no can't. Way. No way. That's where we have to have that real empathy in yeah. the loop. Yeah. That's right. Completely. So I'd now like us to move on to the area of equal access. So Mexico is one of the only nations in the world that recognizes the right of its people uh, to have access to broadband internet connection. In America, 21 million people lack advanced broadband internet access. Most of those without um, internet access are those that are in the rural areas. So if I start with you, Nick, on this question, do you think that access to the internet should be a human right? I'm not sure exactly how to <clears throat> answer the question of what should or shouldn't be a human right. I mean, in the sense, there's a whole bunch of 
uh, goods that we would want everybody to have. Clean water, good food, healthcare, education. And I mean, in some sense, you just want to put as much as possible on that list in that mm. there's a lot of things you think everybody should have. Within societies where more and more public services go online and where being connected is more and more necessary for just being able to participate in public mm. life mm -hmm. and civic society. To that extent, it does seem like it's a basic service. Uh, the same as like having access to mail and water and uh, you know telephone service or being able to talk to read in school. Like it does seem to become part of the basic toolkit that you should be equipped with as a citizen. Okay, so if I come to you, Professor Kaku, I want to go back to one of your earlier comments where you talked about merging um, with this technology to become a superhuman. If so many people in the world don't have access to the internet and don't have access to the tool that allows us to connect with this technology, will we get to a place where when we are merging, it's only the super rich or those that have some level of affluence that'll be able to do it because those without it won't be able to afford to. Well, first of all, I don't think that everything should be a human right, like plumbing, for example. Plumbing is very useful. Without it, we have tremendous epidemics. We have many millions of people dying. Plumbing is really essential for society. But governments, of course, our taxpayers' money allows governments to have universal plumbing. Same thing with the internet. Moore's Law, because Moore's Law is still in effect, means that computer power exponentially is dropping in price. And now with Elon Musk sending satellites into orbit, thousands of these satellites in principle, we're talking about the entire planet being digitized in the same way that universal plumbing is with us. The, the internet will naturally become so cheap that it will simply not be a social issue. Mm. Now also, let's, let's be real. These technologies are initially expensive. The inventor has to make their return back or else they're not gonna invent. And that's why initially these inventions are for rich people. Yeah. However, because of Moore's Law, mass production, because of teamwork, because of the proliferation of knowledge, prices go down. That's also universal. People want it. Supply and demand drives the cost down. So I think that when we begin the process of merging with our creations, again, many, many decades of centuries in the future, yes, initially it'll be for the people who can help pay for it. Yeah. But once it gets off the ground, then I think it's for everyone. Rana, I could see some skepticism on your face. Was I right in picking that up? <laughs> you know, it's not skepticism, it's just a concern, right? First, I, I do feel that in, in one way or another, some of us have merged with our technologies, right? Like we, we, we are so reliant on our devices and our devices are superpowers. So, right, so people who have access to AI, whether it be it in their organizations or in their personal lives, they are already better off. And I'm concerned that this divide, economic divide as a result of the technological divide will keep increasing more and more and more. And, you know, I grew up in the Middle East and, you know, I, I feel very privileged where I am right now, but I, but I, but I re recognize that it's a privilege and, you know, a lot of people are being left behind. And I think, we should not be okay with that. I mean, back to the conversation around inclusion, we need to make sure that these careers in technology are accessible to people who ordinarily would not have access to it. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of this conversation. It has been absolutely riveting hearing you all explain uh, the future of this technology and also making it understandable uh, for everyday citizens, which is what we need. Um, I'd like you all uh, to end uh, with one thought, one thought you'd like to leave the audience with. If I come to you first, Rana. For me, it's all about building empathy and taking a human-centered approach to designing our machines. And I fundamentally believe that if we do that, we will not only reimagine human machine interfaces, um, but also ultimately human to human communication. And I think we have agency to make it great. Well, I think that is a fantastic answer. And that's the kind of technology I would like, Rana. <laughs> uh, Professor Kaku, 
Yes, the fundamental question of all societies is, where does wealth come from anyway? Right. You talk to a politician, and they say wealth comes from taxes. You tax Peter to pay Paul. But that's a zero-sum game. You talk to an economist, where does wealth come from? You just print money. But then that just means your grandchildren have to pay off your debts. <laughs> so where does wealth come from? I say it comes from science. Science and technology is the ultimate origin of all wealth in all human societies. And what is the key to that? The key to that is not taxes. The key to that is not printing money. The key to that is education. Mm. To have an educated population fluent in some of the laws of science so that they can invent things to enrich people. Yeah. So forget about what the politicians and everyone else says about wealth. They simply cut the pie in a different way. They want to cut the pies thinner and thinner. Tax Peter to pay Paul. I say we need a bigger pie. That's what and I that's say. Here, here. A bigger pie and then there's more slices to go around, exactly. Right, and that pie comes from scientists inventing scientific inventions because they are educated, because they went to schools, they learned the laws of science, they were free, free to let their imagination roam. That's what made this country great in terms of its inventions. Brilliant, well thank you for that. Nick? Um, despite all the um difficulties and problems and scandals and struggles that are always happening every day that we are still in in a relatively privileged time out of all the generations that have ever lived none has been as rich as we are mm. uh, vast swaths of the world are at peace um, we have more access to information than ever before. More is known by scientists. More people are educated and can read. And now we have this internet thing that we can all connect to one another. Yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we have it really pegged up in, 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 in a huge number of wonderful ways. And um, I think, well, A, we should count our blessings and uh, spend some time being kind of maybe appreciative of this. But B, uh, try to use this huge privilege that we have to build the long-term future on a more robust foundation. We should use this time of abundance to store up nuts. We should build more robust institutions that can deal with whatever challenges the future throw up. Um, whether it is, you know, in the space of uh, preventing war by building friendships and institutions and cementing norms, um, or whether it's uh, cultivating traditions of wisdom and reflection and careful deliberation and conversation that will then hopefully let us deal <clears throat> more effectively and wisely with new things, that, that new challenges that come mm. up. And, and these new technologies, they're going to be really hard to, to predict and foresee. And, and there's going to be a big cloud of confusion and controversy when they start happening. But if, if we have trained people up and developed kind of epistemic norms and habits um, that are better than what we currently have, then I think we will be better positioned. So, so we should, in other words, use this time now when conditions are relatively good to, to, to lay the foundations. To train people, yes, yeah. I agree. Um, so we totally. can weather, weather the storms that will not out uh, uh, strike us later in this century. Uh and it's so important, Nick, because we know that there's a generation of young people, educated young people, who probably won't get their first job for a couple of years. And what are we having them do in that time? What you suggest could be a really good way of using that time that they may have on their hands while the economy fixes itself. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I've enjoyed this conversation incredibly. It's been fantastic just hearing all of your insights. Uh, the world is changing radically and rapidly, and we all have our own experiences. We all have our points of view. You've heard the points of view of our speakers today, but we also wanna hear your point of view, the viewers. We wanna know what your ideas are in terms of how we can use this moment to reset and shape a better future. So speak up, comment on our social media channels, subscribe to our channels for more episodes of Project Reset, and let's continue this dialogue. Thank you for watching, everyone. Bye.